Florida culture was a vibrant place long before the arrival of European settlers. Several cultures coexisted in harmony with nature and flourished under the extreme climate and landscape of the Florida Peninsula. Now many of these societies are facing a second extinction as their place in history is slowly disappearing. Many Native American villages existed in the area between northern boundary of the Withlacoochee River, eastern boundary of Polk County, and the southern boundary of Marco Island, defining a population called Safety Harbor Culture. Here we will focus on the indigenous people of the area. Very little is known about the Safety Harbor culture because they left no written history behind. The only remaining traces of their civilization are recreated through archaeological evidence and narratives written by the original Spanish explorers. Ultimately, much of this information is speculative because many of the original ruins of the Native Americans have been lost or destroyed by time, weather, and conflict. Spanish explorers left few written accounts of their encounters with the Native peoples. Much of their accounts are inaccurate or incomplete owing to cultural bias or stereotyping several tribes into one. Two such local cultures are the Tocobaga and the Yuzita. The Tocobaga Indians were a group of prehistoric and historic Native Americans living near Tampa Bay, Florida, up until roughly 1760. Yuzita, or Yusita, was the name of a 16th century Native chieftain, so named after its main village. The Thomas Mound, formerly located near the mouth of the Little Manatee River on the south side of Tampa Bay, is believed to be the site of the Yuzita village. The Thomas Mound is no longer in existence, so much of the information on these tribes was preserved in 1937 by Clarence B. Moore and later Ripley Bullen in excavations prior to its destruction. Shell cups, beads, and human burials were found illustrating facets of native life. European contact was also noted in artifacts such as beads, copper, and glass. In an ironic twist of fate, finding both together, what drove these native cultures to extinction may also be the only hope in preserving them. Life in Florida was never easy and resisted major settlement until modern conveniences tackled the extreme climate, terrain, and wildlife. Native cultures knew how to survive in their regions by living off the land, countering the heat, and avoiding predators. Without any natural shelters available to seek safety from the elements, the Uzita made ingenious use of natural resources to build sturdy huts and a focal point of their culture. The basic structure of the traditional hut was constructed using a naturally growing reed similar to bamboo. Overlapping palmetto leaves were tied onto cross members to form the thatched roof and walls providing protection from the sun and rain, yet porous enough to harness outside breezes. By blocking the high solar load and drawing cooler air from below to replace the warmer air escaping through the thatch, Uzita craftsmen designed and constructed well-built houses that withstood Florida storms while harnessing an effective primitive air conditioning. Families didn't typically dwell in the hut and were primarily used for escaping the elements. Social gatherings were outside around meals or religious events. The Uzita community was described as consisting of the chief's house and seven or eight other houses. The chief's hut stood near the beach upon a very high man-made mound for defense. At the other end of the village was a temple used for worship. Finding your next meal took skill and planning. Whether it was a hunt or foraged through basic agriculture, the Uzita had to master their environment and develop tools. Stone tools and pot shards were found in the Thomas Mound excavations. The Uzita most likely constructed these stone implements from resources found in the local region or acquired materials through trade with other settlements. Important stone tools include Pinellas Point arrowheads, archaic style large arrow points, and grinding stones. These tools were mainly for hunting, a basis of the tribe's nomadic diet. Much of what we assume about the Uzita diet is based on studying the tools used and extrapolated from other more documented tribes in the area. Based on the geographic region of the Tokobaga and the Uzita, researchers hypothesized the Uzita most likely ate locally available fish, shellfish, reptiles, and mammals for protein in their diet. While both the Uzita and Tokobaga gathered plants, seeds, berries, and roots to supplement their diet, most likely only the Tokobaga grew maize or what we call corn. Unfortunately, this part of the archaeological record did not survive. Encounters with other tribes were sometimes violent, and Spanish contact was no different. Longbows were extensively used for defense. Some arrows were sharpened reeds that could pierce a shield, or splinter and penetrate chainmail, while others had fishbone or stone points. Spanish accounts report the Uzita were very agile, and would flee a Spanish advance and then attack on the Spanish retreat. Their skills were commended by witnesses who claimed warriors could fire three or four arrows in the time it took a crossbowman to fire a single shot, and possessed extremely high accuracy. Uzita fashion was highly functional in the Florida climate. 
Relying on locally sourced materials, the tribe fashioned loincloths out of animal hides such as deer for the men and sash and skirt like attire for the women. Spanish moss, a light silvery greenish colored plant that grows in the trees across the southern states, was also employed as a plentiful, breathable, flexible, water repellent fabric. Fish bones were commonly used as needles and plant material as thread. The Yuzita Indians' traditional color was red for important ceremonies like weddings, funerals, or even war. Red paints were created using natural plants and dyes applied in patterns throughout the body. They would also create armband tattoos using shell beads and pearls. Burial of the tribe's dead involved a two-step process. First, the dead were prepared and interred in a wooden chest stored in the charnel house. A charnel house offered privacy and shelter, as well as enough workspace for mortuary proceedings. At a later date, a group burial was conducted at the mound. Religious beliefs in both tribes relied heavily upon human sacrifice in their practice of worship. Juan Ortiz, who had been sent on a small boat to search for the missing Narvez expedition, was captured by the Uzita tribe. For several years, he was tasked to guard the bodies in the charnel house from wild animals at night. Utiza, the chief, planned to roast Ortiz over a grill, but the chief's daughter asked her father to spare him from sacrifice. When the chief later planned again to sacrifice Ortiz, the chief's daughter helped the Spaniard to escape to the neighboring chiefdom of Mocaso. The people of Uzita were the first inhabitants of Florida to be encountered by both the Narvez expedition in 1528 and the DeSoto expedition in 1539. In the end, Spanish contact was believed to be the death of the Uzita tribe. The Spanish were among the Uzita for only a short time when many of the Uzita were decimated by raging epidemics of European diseases believed introduced during trade, or a combination of being enslaved or killed in battle. Uzita is not mentioned in Spanish records after the departure of the DeSoto expedition. From the facts we know to the information we hypothesize, we still have large gaps in our knowledge and understanding of the Uzita tribe. Access to the original artifacts and records is slowly being lost to time and development. Preservation is only possible through increased awareness of our native civilizations across Safety Harbor culture and a renewed interest in local archaeology. Methodical study of the Uzita and their neighbors shed light on the village size and life, the use of ceramic and shell tools, the extent of trade in materials and goods between villages, and how life existed in Tampa Bay long before anyone thought to call it Florida. In the end, it is an amazing experience to touch the past in a way that enriches our appreciation and understanding of the world we share.